Um, we are hosting this um, in partnership with the Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency. Um, we have a very large registration list. Um, so we're gonna probably have a few of you joining, um, but we're gonna try to get started for all those that you showed up on time. Um, today's class is Design 101, how to get started. We're gonna be covering some principles of re-looking at your landscape and looking ways to be more water wise. Um, we have a few more people joining us right now. And we have Juanita, um, our wonderful guest speaker to cover the content today. Could you guys want to move to the next slide? Okay. So to hear some housekeeping on today's webinar. Um, so everyone probably noticed we have all the attendees on mute, so we don't have any background noise. If you have any questions that come up during today's webinar, please put it into the Q&A that you'll see at the bottom. Um, we also have raising hands to ask questions, but again, today we have a very large attendance, so it might be easiest if you guys can put it into the Q&A and Shelby will be helping me moderate that and we'll be answering those questions. We will try to hold questions till the end where we have a lot of time to go through those. Um, if there's something um, that is relevant at that time, we'll bring it up to Juanita so we can address it at that time. Also for everyone to know, today's um, class will be recorded and we'll be sharing that out. Just like what we do in our previous events, um, we'll share this recording and we'll also provide other rebates and information we covered today. So if you're interested in taking action and doing some of these practices at your own home and wanna get some rebates doing so, we'll share that with you. And those emails will probably go out later this week, if not early next week. Um, again, we're co-hosting this with BOSCA, the Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency. This is made up of 26 agencies in over three counties and 1.8 um, million people. Um, we are a member of the city of Palo Alto. The goal of BOSCA is to provide high quality water at a fair price. And the objective that we are doing today is actually in landscape education is to really focus on outdoor water use. And that's one of the largest um, kind of culprits for single family residents is actually outside water use. So we're really trying to educate individuals on how to use water wisely and making water conservation a way of life here in California. Um, these are some rebates that are available to um, some Bosca agencies. Um, again, we partner with Valley Water, so we'll send that in our um, email blast with our rebates that with our partner, um, and that's the agency you would go for pre-approval. Um, and again, there's a lot of rebates that I'll discuss later on that we actually cost share with Valley Water. So for Palo Alto residents, they're actually increased. These are again uh, rebates that would be available on how to get access for other Bosca agencies. Um, that may be attending this event as well. And if you're interested in other classes like you guys are joining us today, here's some other upcoming classes that you may be interested in. Um, and again, you go to the same website to register as you did today. And here's another great resource if you guys are interested in um, seeing other resources on waterwise gardening. Without further ado, we have Juanita to cover um, our main content today. And again, feel free if you guys have questions, if you just joined us for housekeeping, please put in your question in the Q&A. We'll try to hold those till the end. Um, and then Shelby's gonna help moderating those and we'll be uh, bringing those up towards again, probably eight to 8.30, we'll be more and more doing the Q&A. And again, we'll be recording this and sending these resources out to everyone. All right, I'll take over from here, shall I, Kevin? No, oh, perfect, thank you. Okay, hi everybody. I'm Juanita Salisbury, I'm a landscape architect here in Palo Alto. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, design one in basics. 
And just a quick background on me. I do uh, have a degree in landscape architecture as well as a degree in biopsychology. And so these two areas of education uh, play a role, big role in what I do now. Um, I also uh, take care of some pollinator gardens here in Palo Alto and you can uh, see what's happening with those on our social media of the Primrose, pollinator, Primrose Way Pollinator Garden on both Facebook and Instagram and also on YouTube. So the gardens that I do take care of here in Palo Alto, we have five. One is the Primrose Way Pollinator Garden. This is Embarcadero Road here. Uh, the Arcadia Place Garden, the Island Drive Garden, Gwinda Street Garden, and Hopkins Avenue Pollinator Garden. If you have a chance to go out and visit those gardens, everything is starting to bloom nicely. And they're all California native plants, so you can see what these plants look like in the environment. So today I'm going to assume that people are starting from scratch here. And um, what I mean by scratch is you want you have a blank slate and you want to start your landscape. How do you do it? Um, so there are six basic topics here. The first is how to lay out your landscape site analysis and measurement. This is really important in terms of having a good map of your land that you can use. Uh, the second, basics of landscape design. And I'm all about function, especially form following function. Uh, three will be designing the hardscape first. And hardscape are things like patios, sidewalks, driveways. And then once you figure out the hardscape, then you do the planting. And then how do you do the planting? And so I'm gonna talk about how to develop a plant palette and then talk about basic planting design. How do you make it look nice with the plants? And then some um, irrigation and maintenance issues because now that you have this landscape, how do you take care of it? Always a very important thing. So first off, site analysis and measurement. I'm using here an actual client's backyard. This is, these are all before shots. And what we have here at the beginning, we do site inventory and analysis. What's there and what are the opportunities? So inventory, look at everything, vegetation, existing landscape, utilities, and so forth. You know, do you have a telephone pole in the backyard, electrical pole? Do you have one little sliver of a good view? Do you have a change in elevation? Do you have unconnected downspouts? Do you have utilities? What about little vents on your house? These are all things that you need to know. Um, and also take a look to see where the north uh, side of your property is, where are the warm spots, the cool spots? Is there glare, noise, wind, all these things that are factors that help you decide what, you, what it is that you want to accomplish with your landscape. Number one, have a map that's drawn to scale. This is the most important thing, actually. Um, and what I like to do when I go out and measure sites um, is I like to use graph paper. Here, each of these little squares is an eighth of an inch. And so it, it makes it easy to measure things on site. One square can equal one foot. So this would be one eighth of an inch equals a foot. That's what we mean by a scale drawing. So take inventory of everything. Um, this is, if you consider these lines here, the big fat heavy lines, this is the house and then the fence line around the back here. Um, so some details about measuring is whenever I, I go out to measure, I'll take two very long tapes with me and I'll start on one side of the property. You see there's a little zero with feet four inches and then I'll pull another tape in another direction um, here starting with a little zero going down and I'll leave these tapes in place as I'm measuring where the windows and the doors start. Here are some doors which way they're swinging that's always important. Some existing hardscape here's that retaining wall that we saw and so forth. Once you have this you have your base map and you can design right on top of this. And that's exactly what I've done here in this next slide, or actually not this slide, but let's talk first. Now that we have our base map, um, you have to really think about what it is that you want to accomplish in your backyard. 
you know, how do you want to use the area? And truly form follows function. It's all about function. So list the function uh, for the space that you want. What do you want to do in the space? Do you want to have a vegetable garden? Uh, do you want an outdoor dining area? Do you want a bar? Do you want a habitat garden? Of course, you have a house. So think of these spaces as outdoor rooms with hallways, walls, and floors, but the sky is the ceiling. And so look at these relationships. What things make sense to be together, like dining next to the barbecue? Maybe the fire pit is somewhere in the middle. Okay, and then draw arrows. How do these things relate to each other? And these arrows help you get a sense of what sort of circulation is between those areas. So movement between areas, movements between function. Very important. All right, now, now you can take a piece of tracing paper, this translucent paper that you see here, lay it right on top of your uh, base map that you can just see underneath there and put your functions on. Um, so here's the house. I came, I drew over that with a nice Sharpie to make it stand out. There's the door, you know, we put the dining over here because there's this wonderful view of the mountains, the only really good view in the backyard here, a uh, fire pit exit over here. And so getting a, a sense of the circulation through the area and sort of defining the areas is very important. So movement between the functions um, with these little double ended arrows here, and then very generally showing some green areas. These will be your planting areas. You definitely want to do the hardscape first. That's the most expensive thing and figuring that out. Okay, so movement between the functions. Now let's talk about just quickly, if you want your design to look super professional, what are some design tips? And um, okay, again, hardscape areas first and decide on the forms that work best for your situation. Modern um, houses look good with something that's very uh, square, maybe with some very uh, nicely defined curves, but basically consider your overall composition and the relationship between the shapes. So for example, do things line up? Are things on an axis between shapes? Okay, use arcs and tangents. Okay, rather than a random curve, random curves are not really well defined. Uh, you want to avoid acute angles, things that are less than 90 degrees, because those are maintenance issues. Um, and also repeat elements in your composition to harmonize the composition. So this, these little arcs repeat this larger arc, and um, they're just smaller, it's the same element, but at a smaller scale. Similarly, these small squares repeat this larger square, and that's how you generate harmony, is to repeat elements like this. So a few design tips, and that's one of the, the, the big design secrets. Oak to overlay, you put your next overlay, overlay number one, where you're starting to look at form. And for this particular client, I wanted to do something very modern. So I went with something square, just generally showing a dining table there, uh, a little barbecue over there, and then some steps down um, because once again, they had a change in elevation. And just you can see underneath where I was generally showing where the fire pit was going to go and where the dining was going to go. And then leaving areas then for trees. So, um, and then from there, you could put another piece of trace paper uh, over the top and then show where your shrubs and perennials will go. So here are masses of some shrubs and smaller things like perennials towards uh, the front of the hardscapey areas. That's a very general way of looking at um, the design. And, you know, again, use graph paper, super easy, especially if you know how big your furniture is going to be outside, your tables, your chairs. Um, this person had a smoker, and you can get a, a, a really good uh, fit of what you have versus what your, uh, what your space is. This is the refined concept. It's a big jump from what we saw before. Um, but again, something showing very generally the hardscape. And there's a lot of hardscape here. 
these particular clients wanted to entertain up to 100 guests at a time. So obviously seating would be important. Um, so we have the steps coming down from these doors that open outward and a big dining area here where they can see that great view, their barbecue area off to the side, a fire pit area down here with retaining walls then taking up that change in elevation. So lots of places for people to sit, lots of great circulation. I'm showing planting here, but I'm not showing what it is. I'm just showing what it might look like with trees being shown and then smaller perennials in the front, larger shrubs toward the back. Now, now that we've gone through four years of landscape architecture in terms of hardscape design, um, developing your plant palette, what do you plant? Um, and I use exclusively California native plants. And I do that because California is a biodiversity hotspot. We have 8,000, almost 8,000 species of plants here in California um, that are found almost nowhere else in the world, even outside of our state. And uh, we have a lot of great pollinators here. We have 1,600 species of native bees, not honeybees, those are not native, uh, which is more than any other state in the United States. And we have such a huge number of plants because we have such unique ecosystems here in California. Everything from the beach to the desert to redwood forests um, and our 1600 species of native bees. The bees function in the environment is to move genetics around. Okay, they contribute to genetic diversity that way. So plants, <laughs> let's talk about plants. Plants are the beginning of everything. And so um, they are the primary producers of food. These, we, I, I was, I'm all about function. So let's talk about the function of plants. So energy from the sun is converted by the plants into uh, carbohydrates and other nutrients that insects eat. Okay, here's a nice fat caterpillar. And then those caterpillars are then turned into baby birds after they're uh, fed those by their mothers. And 37% of our animal species are plant eating insects. And as a rule, native insects only eat the native plants that they evolved with. Super important here. If you have a non-native plant, it's not going to provide food for insects and then no food for baby birds. And uh, pollinators pay, play a key role in all of this by spreading around the genetic diversity of plants so that we have then a diversity of other species that rely on those plants. So plants are pretty, they can be decorative, but they're not really decorations in terms of their real function, plants are food. And that means that the native plants will attract native pollinators and other insects. You plant a native plant, be prepared and be happy when it's being eaten because these little denizens like this one here will turn into a butterfly. And that's what you get when you plant natives. You provide these native plant buffets and the uh, insects, they will come, it's a guarantee. So why is it important to see the native plants as food um, other than that is their actual function? Um, because they attract a variety of native pollinators and other insects, it's good to avoid making your garden an ecological trap, okay? Just because you planted Native plants doesn't mean that's all great. You have to avoid uh, killing those insects once they come and eat your plants and eat the pollen and nectar because they will come. Um, and an ecological trap is something that it exists in the environment that attracts organisms because, and because of that attraction, uh, makes it easier for them to be killed through predation or other means. So like, for example, for the nocturnal pollinators and moths, for example, uh, are attracted to lights after night lighting. And um, an easy way to avoid that is to use motion sensors on lights, outdoor lights, and use blackout curtains in your windows to uh, cut down on uh, external light pollution. So the basics of plant layout. How do you get the spacing correct so that you don't overplant an area and it's not a, a giant jungle to start with? Um, so in planting areas, um, it's always useful if it's a large area to have a little pathway so you can get in there and weed if you need to or do whatever maintenance that you have. 
Then you add your plants from your plant palette, and we'll, we'll talk about how to choose those in a moment, as circles at their mature diameter. Most circles should just touch but can overlap for spacing. Okay, so like these uh, here following the pathway, just touch. Some there's more overlap. Um, some can be underneath other plants. Um, you want to plant in masses um, and then accent with larger trees and shrubs. For a natural look, plant in odd numbers um, and start with the big stuff first. That's the easy way to do it. Plant large trees first, then shrubs. Then you layer in your perennials, your vines, your bulbs, and your succulents and your annuals. Um, and then again, don't forget to plan for plants underneath tall trees and shrubs. So underneath some of these larger shrubs, there's still bare areas that can be planted up. This is what an actual planting plan looks like. A uh, good landscape architect will provide you with something pretty like this. Um, it's basically a construction drawing. And so um, here I'm showing the plants um, at their mature diameter overlapping. And then we've got one, two, three of these Ceanothus maritimus here. And what this does, once you have this, is that you know the numbers of plants that you need. And so you can figure out how much it's all going to cost. You know, I need, oh, I need eight of these and 10 of those and 36 of those and so forth. Um, again, lay out plants in the masses. So uh, like in the back here, we've got uh, Arctostaphylus densiflora, the manzanita. Larger plants and trees can be can go towards the back, smaller plants and lower plants towards the edges and near walkways. If you have a small space, this is a great little tip, plant things that are low growing because otherwise it will kind of take up space and make the space seem even smaller. Um, so leave some space for the humans uh, next to the pathways. Again, why California native plants? Um, and with 8,000 species, it's like, why bother really with anything else? Unless you have a favorite, couple of favorites that are non-natives and everybody has those. Um, but some native non-native plants are bad. They can escape cultivation and infest natural areas and destroy natural ecosystems or bring in uh, diseases and exotic insects. And planting native keeps California looking like California. And, but really basically they're well, evolved to thrive in our climate. Um, there are many, many California native plant species that are uh, adapted to our hot, dry summers here and our wet winters. Um, and many of them are drought tolerant once they're established. Very low water use plants are available. I mean, like some of them don't like to be watered at all during uh, the summertime, which is wonderful. So what to plant? How do you decide what to plant? And I like to go to the California Native Plant Society who has provided this wonderful searchable database. The calscape.org database is wonderful for looking for information and resources for finding California native plants. Um, and you can create your palette from this database of trees, shrubs, perennials, bulbs, vines, and succulents. A great website to look around. Um, it talks about Calscape, their planting guide, nurseries where you can find these plants because sometimes they can be hard to find. Um, you can create your own plant lists, which you can then download into an Excel spreadsheet and keep track of things. And then um, the, the butterflies, the larvae that feed on each of these plants. And here it breaks things down for California, 7,990. Um, all plants, trees, shrubs, perennials, and so forth. So you should be able to find something that will work in this database. But we go back to the function of plants uh, as being food. And so a better question uh, then becomes who to feed. My uh, degree in psychology was actually, um, I studied ingestive behavior, eating and drinking. And so now as a landscape architect, I'm still studying eating and drinking, but in a different way. Um, so who to feed? And this is actually a good way to help you decide which plants to plants if you have a choice between two species. One works, one works, which one do you go with? Well, um, consider here uh, biology uh, for helping make a decision. 
We know that speciation, that is how things evolve over time in terms of species developing, it occurs more rapidly when you have pollinators. So things that are pollinated by bees um, and other pollinators um, can evolve and you get different colors of flowers coming up because those bees are moving the genes around the environment. That's what bees do. It happens much faster than with like wind pollinated things that don't use uh, pollinators. And what that says here is that the biological factors may be more important considerations than abiotic factors like climate, geology, and water for determining what to plant. So what I like to tell people is to look at the butterflies. We have 1,368 butterflies and moths native to California, um, and it lists those, and then it shows the host plants. And so um, you can use their uh, guide here to help you also with some of the nitty gritty things that they talk about, um, you know, with irrigation tips, how to establish plants, how to mulch with leaves and other great information that I don't have time to go into here. So start with a keystone plant genera. So keystone plants, those are the plants that dozens, hundreds, or thousands of other species rely on. So if you think of an archway made of stones, the center arch is the key that holds everything together. And those keystone plants then form the backbone of habitat resources, food, shelter, and nesting sites. Um, they help other plant species to survive. Uh, plants communicate with each other underground and um, form communities amongst themselves. And they, uh, the keystone plants provide food for dozens or hundreds of types of caterpillar species, depending on uh, those plants or uh, countless other animals. So the takeaway technique is to um, include at least a few keystone species. Ah, keystone species in California are our oaks. So start with trees first. No, start with big stuff. Find the big things that will work in your environment first. And trees, not only are they food, but one of their other functions, and I'm big on function, how does it fit in? What does it do? Is they save water. Trees actually help form the, uh, the rain cycle. I'm sure you probably remember from grade school, the picture of the ocean, the mountains next to it, the clouds rising up going over the mountains and then raining down, that being part of the water cycle, only half. The other half is when trees breathe out, they breathe out water. And so they pull water up from the ground table and then um, breathe that out and form the other half of the rain cycle. And we can actually end up with rivers of water in the sky. Um, trees also improve water quality by filtering the rainwater. They slow down impacts of heavy rain. Um, and you also get to have these beautiful butterflies because like this California sister butterfly uh, eats oak species. So, uh, and if you don't have room for a big oak like Quercus agrifolia, our coast live oak, that's my husband there, he's six foot three, so you can get a sense of how big these things are, plant a scrub oak. They don't get as big and you can actually grow them in pots. So try to get an oak into your environment and you'll be happily rewarded with butterflies. So, and how do you decide on a tree for your location? What I like to do is to rank those trees by the number of butterflies and moths that it hosts, okay? Um, choose what will fit in size for your location and its water needs. Uh, it, and then you can do searches on Calscape, enter a California address to see trees native to that location. Here we have Santa Clara County. And it says 13 trees native to Santa Clara County. And the first one here is the Valley Oak, Quercus lobata. Actually, Quercus lobata used to be 61% of the tree cover back in colonial days here in, in the Santa Clara Valley. So, and then it ranks and uh, lots of different choices here. Um, second, then once you've decided on the trees that you want, choose your keystone shrubs. Again, again I like to rank them. You can sort these by the number of um, uh, butterflies and moth species that they uh, host. And so again, it's 29 shrubs native to Santa Clara County. And 
they vary in terms of how much water they, they use and what their forms are, when they bloom, that kind of thing. Um, but really a lot of great choices here. Um, and then choose your perennials. I didn't pull up the Calscape for that because I these are plants that we use in our, um, our pollinator gardens. And um, they're all big nectar and uh, pollen producers for bees. Um, and they're also, I like to plant things that provide nectar, pollen, and larval food sources so that they have three functions there, uh, providing protein, sugar, and then uh, uh, the uh, vegetative resources, the, the, uh, the leaves and whatnot that the larvae eat. Um, I also like to use annuals in the gardens, um, mostly because we have a huge, gigantic number of annuals in this uh, in this state. A uh, lot of floral resources. Um, they're the most under threat natives from competition from non-native grasses. A huge variety, not typically available in nurseries, super easy for the most part to raise these from seed. Um, successive sowing, over time you can go out and throw out some more seed and they'll, they'll grow. Many recede in place. Um, some lower growing ones can be sown underneath shrubs. A lot are easy to grow in pots and uh, sowing things from seed preserves genetic diversity. Okay, three easy annuals that I like to use. Uh, poppies, uh, poppies are wonderful. They produce pollen only, they don't have any nectar. And interesting thing about poppies is that they are buzz pollinated. What that means is that the flower has to be vibrated at a certain frequency for the pollen to come out. Um, and uh, bumblebees are really good at that. Honeybees don't do it so much. Um, and the uh, poppy is also a larval food source for new terpies edwardsata, which is a nice, beautiful cream colored moth that we have here. Um, Gilea capitata, beautiful blue flower, super easy, very seedy, will reseed itself uh, very freely. And then uh, Phacelia tanacetifolia, um, both pollen and nectar, um, wonderful resources, uh, really tasty nectar according to the insects I've spoken with. And showy flowers, you know, throw some annuals in there. This is one of my favorite mixes that I, I like to use. These are show stoppers. Uh, the neighbors will be so jealous. Clarkia amoena. I just threw that in there because it's pretty. Um, and I also raise a lot of things from seed because I need a lot of plants and I don't like to spend a ton of money, but I have time. And so I will take seeds, put them into a wet coffee filter, stick them into a plastic baggie and put it in the refrigerator, cold moist stratification. And then after uh, a few days, I keep checking them until I see the root tip emerging and then I pot them up. And this is a toothpick, which is very scientific, um, but that's how I know that they've germinated. Some things take longer than others, um, you know, so it's great fun for science experiments and whatnot, but that's an easy way to get a lot of things that you may not find in nurseries. You raise them from seed. Um, so let's talk about moisture here. Remember the other function that we have of trees is to help with the water cycle. And this is from calscape.org from their planting guide page where they're showing the oak reaching down into the deep moisture, the water table with their tap roots. And then they have these surface roots and through various um, fungi that live in the soil, they share water with other plants like our toyon, the Hedermelis arbutifolia, um, the coyote bush, sages, buckwheats, and so forth. So you can get plants to share water um, that's provided by the oak that's reached down into the water table, which cuts down on the amount of water that we use in our landscapes. So more plants um, in a landscape. And once you have your basic design, keep adding plants because they will provide a lot of resources and help each other. Um, and so this is a, a quick little sketch that I did uh, sort of just solidifying those relationships, this black line being the ground level here. So we've got trees um, shedding water, breathing out water, helping clouds form, pulling that water up from the water table. And you can 
put water back in the water table with swales. I like to use swales in my designs and swales are just a low area where water can collect from downspouts and um, other areas. And they, the swales become prime places for planting because that area is gonna be moist. Another way to keep moisture in the soil with, are with leaves and twig piles. And you'll find that plants will send runners out to those areas that are moist. Okay, they'll find it. Um, you can trap moisture with rocks. Okay, and um, you can then start building complexity into your uh, planted areas. And those complex relationships will make the garden much stronger in terms of its resiliency. Uh, and I like to have vines crawling up through shrubs, piles of leaves underneath trees, because remember, we have those larvae um, up in the trees, and sometimes they drop down uh, into these leaf piles where they then overwinter. And if you have the gardeners coming with the leaf blowers and blowing them away, you won't have um, protein for birds, you won't have butterflies. Okay, so leave the leaves. That's how you maintain the leaves, just leave them, leave them there. Um, you know, and get them off the sidewalks and things like that. But really, um, leaves are ecosystem gold. All right, so here's an example of a swale that I designed for a client and their downspouts uh, and exit into this beautiful swale. Um, they weren't really sure about this at first. And when they put it in, it's now their favorite part of the garden. We've got all kinds of nice native plants next to boulders. Um, and uh, that's where all their downspouts goes, the redwoods that they have in the backyard like it a lot. And then you can see what I was talking about. Plants like to grow with their roots underneath boulders. That's a nice moist uh, place for them to establish. I had to throw this in here. Plant something that blooms early for bumblebees. Here in Palo Alto, we have bees that come out in January. This particular one, we have Two species of bumblebees here in Palo Alto, Bombus melanopigus, the black-tailed bumblebee. Look how cute that little black tail is. Um, they come out in January, followed by the yellow-faced bumblebee, which is active now. Um, bumblebees active in the colder weather because they can regulate their body temperature, but super cute. Um, you plant this shrub and you will have these cute little things coming and visiting. Uh, some other things that we have in their gardens, um, asters and I like to show the various uh, bee species that we have here in Palo Alto. I go out and photograph quite a lot uh, to show just what the function is for these plants out in the environment. Uh, Helenium pubarulum uh, will reseed itself happily. Grindelia, super uh, wonderful landscape plant for resources. Areophyllum confortifolium with a cute little leaf cutter bees. Leaf cutters have these cute little uh, fuzzy abdomens where they they carry pollen. Um, some people say, well, I want to help pollinators. What kind of plant should I plant? What attracts them? What you should probably plant are um, plants that are for the specialist bees, bees that raise their young on that pollen alone, like asters. And here we have several different species here. Um, uh, Melisoides over here, a leaf cutter here, uh, a nice yellow faced bumblebee with her yellow head there. And here's that design that I first showed you. There's that ugly telephone pole, but when everything grows, we won't be able to see that and their dining table. This was literally the day after they finished and everything is small, but it won't be small for long. Um, but really at the beginning, resist temptation to overplant. Um, you know, people say, oh, this is really tiny. I need to put more in, but this plant will fill in the space eventually. Um, when you get these plants to a mature stage and you have these open spaces for other things, then work in your bulbs, uh, work in your vines and succulents, other things that will just add more complexity to the environment and help, help save uh, uh, water and help them share water. Once you have it, how do you take care of it? Remember, the function of plants is that they are food. And so you will have things showing up to eat them. Um, so we have mostly moth larva here on different things. Um, here we have Neoterpes edwardsata on the poppy. Um, 
And really, a lot of insects spend most of their time as a egg or a larva. The adult stage really is about mating and dying. And then, you know, you're an egg or a larva for months and months at a time. Um, leave your leaves in place. Um, as I said before, leaves are ecosystem gold. They help retain moisture. Uh, birds love leaves for the insects. Um, if you don't have a lot of shrubs, but you want birds, pile up some leaves and bugs will come in there and the birds will follow. If you don't like the way that looks, sometimes I will put what I call the skim coat of bark chips on the top, one chip thick, so it looks uniform. And 70% of our native bees nest underground, so a few areas of uh, bare ground is important. It doesn't have to be big, an area of maybe two by two feet. Okay, and I try not to walk in those areas because I don't want to step on the nest entrances. Um, pruning decisions, how do you prune plants? I try to prune things out of walkways so that I can get through, but most of the time I leave things. I leave stems because um, insects will nest as larvae inside stems. And um, if you're planting because you want biodiversity, the last thing you want to do is remove the larva. <laughs> so, um, so I leave the stems for the most part, or if I cut them, I cut, the, cut them down to about a foot because if the bees are nesting inside those stems, they will nest in the, the first foot or so from the root. Um, and some overwinter, you can see that they pull leaves together. And these are katydid eggs on a dead branch. I left those and they were like that for months until they hatched. So again, um, look and see what you're pruning before you prune, try to be careful. And then I just leave the prunings in the garden in case there's something there. Um, again, you know, leave the eight to 12 inches of the stem because things actually do go inside of the, the hollow pithy stems like this. Um, and this again creates complexity. If you leave stems, um, some people like, for example, will cut down their asters after they they bloomed and they cut these dry stems. And at the very top will be these fluffy seed heads I don't cut them down because hummingbirds will then come and use the fluff for their nest. Um, in bamboo stakes, we have this cute little leaf cutter bee coming out. This is in my own backyard. And at the Gwinda Street Garden, we've added um, some logs here so that they provide additional complexity and additional nesting sites for uh, the bees and other insects to inhabit. Maintenance, you know, a native garden is really just about keeping the weeds down and then le letting it do its thing because the plants will communicate underground. They will change the soil chemistry so that it makes it more likely that more natives will move in and non-natives will move out. Uh, you don't need to fertilize anything. Um, don't use pesticides, obviously. Don't use herbicides because they cause cancer and they kill things. Um, and don't use fungicides. Let the complexity and the number of species that you get into the garden um, establish their own control. Okay. Um, I mulch a little bit to control weeds in places, um, and I really only irrigate the first year or so uh, to really establish the plants, watering if they need it during the summertime, during cool days rather than hot days, because you don't want warm, wet soil. Try not to water on top of the root ball water in a ring around the plant so that you don't get rot in the middle of your plant. Um, and then, you know, some plants only like to be watered about once a month during the summertime, once they're established. Planting season for us in California is uh, late fall to about middle of May when the soil is nice and cool. That makes it much easier to establish the plants. Some of the ongoing decisions, now that you've made your base map, you've designed something that's harmonious, you figure your plant palette, you've got your plants in, what happens next? You know, I've done all these things, what, what do I need to do? Well, enjoy your garden, obviously. But if you wanna keep adding plants, you know, go out and observe, see what's happening. You know, it's really, it turns into a beautiful refuge for all kinds of species. Ask yourself if you're adding more plants, 
does this plant provide forage for local insect species? Can I support the local biodiversity? Is it a keystone species? Keystone species are hugely important. How much water is needed? Some plants don't need very much water. Our native bulbs, for example, don't like water at all during the summer. They want to completely dry out. Okay. Um, does the plant provide nesting opportunities? Is it hard to grow from seed? This is a challenge for some of us who love growing things from seed. Um, does it enhance pollinator resources? And how connected is my garden to other natural spaces? Do I live at a wildlands interface? You know, these are all um, these are all considerations and decision making as to how you then continue forward with your garden. Um, I always like to look very closely before I act um, in any of these gardens. And this is how I think I measure success is, you know, is the garden maintaining itself almost? Um, and the way to ensure success is to keep adding species um, because they really do form a, a community. And when they form those communities, the garden becomes much more resilient, uses less water, um, and is easier to take care of. So, um, you know, I learned this over many years and it wasn't revealed to me all in one day, it was revealed over time. So it's, you know, knowledge doesn't come at us uh, all at once. Um, and the scale of things is very different. So always really look at things. Um, here I was taking a picture of this flower and I did not see this baby Katie did until later. And it saw me before I saw it. So there was definitely a lesson. And that, in a nutshell, is one way to enjoy the garden and end up with a really happy, resilient uh, landscape that uses less water and adds a lot of biodiversity and joy in your life and in our wonderful town of Palo Alto. Um, and I'd be happy to, to answer uh, any questions that anybody might have. Okay, we have, oh, let me turn my video on. Okay, so we have a, a list of questions. We'll just start from the beginning and go through them. Um, the first one is, can you recommend plants that squirrels won't eat? Um, they seem to be very hungry and devastating our garden. Yes, squirrels are definitely a challenge. What I do um, to protect things from squirrels is I use chicken wire cages over plants until they're established or I use a wire basket of some kind. Um, squirrels, it really doesn't matter. Uh, they will eat just about anything except for perhaps some very thorny things, um, but they're digging uh, around the roots of plants. I will use barriers to keep the squirrels out. That is the only thing that really works is like a chicken wire basket um, or a wire uh, basket turned upside down. Um, and I've got a whole lot of those. Um, or just plant something that's a little bit bigger um, so that it's harder for them to dig up. A four inch plant in a four inch pot is really easy pickings as opposed to a 15 gallon shrub. Um, and, but you really can't control what nature does. You can only uh, help it. Okay, so the next question is, um, I have dogs and would would like to replace my lawn with more drought tolerant uh, ground cover. Do you have any recommendations? So there are uh, a few things. Dogs are can be really hard on the landscape. Um, and if you, if you like the look of a lawn, we have native sod blends that use only about a third as much water uh, as non-native grasses. You can do things like, um, uh, Scudelaria californica, which it runs it runs underground. That's a very tough shrub that gets in there. Um, but you know, take a look on Calscape to look at their ground covers that they recommend. Um, but if you want some things that you can walk on, um, you know, a native sod blend is probably your best bet for that. Okay, the next question is, um, can you recommend any software, ideally one that's free, which we can use to try out different plans for an area we want to landscape? Um, so, 
you know, I don't really know of any uh, software that uh, is available for free. There may be some online. Um, for digital drafting myself, I've always used um, AutoCAD, uh, which is not free. Um, but really, um, you know, a hand plan, hand drawn plan for most backyards would work just fine, I think. Um, but there are, there are definitely lots and lots of software packages out there. I just don't use them. Okay, the next question is, even if California is very biodiversified, I'm sure the Bay Area is only a subset of that. Do we have a list of recommendations of plants for the peninsula? Yes, if you go to the calscape.org uh, website, you can actually search to see what grows in your particular area um, and it will show you everything that grows in that area. Um, and that's a good place to start. If that's not enough plants, you can actually expand the search area and look at maybe the surrounding counties um, and then keep going. But yes, we do have specific zones here, um, even within our own county. Um, you know, if we're closer to the water, you know, it's a little bit more temperate than if you're um, maybe up in the foothills where you might get more frost. So, um, and, you know, there might be little niches that, ha are, that never get frost or anything like that. Um, but a great place to start to search for those plants is with the Calscape and they, you can do searching by location. Great. Okay, the next question is, can you talk about some native edible plants? Oh, yes. I love native edibles. Um, I, my own particular thing, I love native strawberries. Uh, uh, Fragaria vesca, which is a great shady plant, and the strawberries are small, but they taste just like candy. Our native hazelnut, you need a male and a female to get hazelnuts. Um, other things, uh, people sometimes report eating the seeds from the bladder pod, Peritoma arborea, which they look like peas. I haven't tried it yet. I have them in the gardens, um, just haven't tried them yet, but those are good. Um, there are all kinds of native berries, uh, native blackberry, there's native thimbleberry, there's, um, oh, just lots of, lots of different choices, certainly. Um, but, you know, um, you can probably find out a little bit more online, but I, I tend to plant things that I, I have some history with. And so blackberries and um, um, strawberries are always uh, in my gardens. Okay, so regarding using mature plant sizes in your plans, California's climate means that plants often grow to the upper end or beyond of the listed mature size. Do you have any suggestions for accommodating that? Um, you can, I would prune them to size. Um, first, select a plant that you think will fit. Um, and then if it's getting too big for that spot, you can uh, trim it back um, in hopefully a, a good manner without like chopping it down. Um, but yeah, don't like don't plant a valley oak in the ten foot wide side yard. This is not a good idea. Um, you know, again, look for a smaller version uh, of things to start with, um, because the plants are very vigorous here. Um, we have some salvias, some sages out at the primrose garden. That it said the mature size was six to eight feet, and now they're fifteen feet across. They're thugs, and so. I just go, I just go in and I cut them back off of some of the other plants that they want. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're very vigorous. So yeah, I mean, yeah, just cut things back if they're, if they're encroaching um, to try to, to maintain some, some order and form, definitely. Okay, the next question is regarding native bee nesting. We have a few year old Salvia apiana. We left the stems on it last year because we know some native bees use the last few inches of the stems to lay their eggs. 
uh, what time of year can you cut the stems off? Um, for basically when have the bees left the nest? Yeah, um, when, you, when you observe the bees coming out, um, you know, if you, if you cut those stalks back, you know, put them in a pile nearby, um, because what happens with those is that the bees will, um, they'll be, the, the eggs will be laid sequentially so that there's bees um, in a line in the stem. Then the first bees that emerge will be the males and then the females come out, but they don't all come out at once. Um, when you see the males flying around, you know what the females are not far behind. Um, you know, take a look maybe on, uh, there's a great app called iNaturalist where you can look up certain bee species and it shows you when the peak of activity is. And if you see females out, um, you know, then go ahead and cut those uh, cut those down. But remember, they're, they're going to still need spaces to, to have more nests. So um, if there's, you know, fresh stems for them to nest in, that would be good. Um, so when it looks like bee activity is high, then you can probably uh, cut those stems back. That means they've all emerged, but the females, you know, some species will only lay like one egg per day um, and provision that nest. Some will do a couple, but it's not a lot. Um, that's what these solitary bees are. They're, they're not like, they don't have a hive. It's one female laying eggs and you don't get like 50 eggs out of one female. You're lucky if you get maybe a dozen. Okay, so um, again, observe to see what it looks like. Um, you know, go ahead and cut the old stems back when they've come out, if you can tell. Um, and then leave some new fresh ones because that'll cut down on disease just spreading and things like that. Okay, the next question is, can you achieve the same moisture larvae benefits with mulch as opposed to leaf piles? I have small children, uh, leaves are not safe from them. <laughs> um, Leaves are really great for uh, many reasons. Um, and you know, you'll get, you'll get decomposition of the mulch. So if, if that's what you have at hand, um, by all means use it. It's not going to be as attractive to the things that eat leaves, even dead leaves. Um, you know, if you can find an out of the way place where your kids can't get to the leaves, um, I would say try to, to to create a couple of piles. I know how kids are. Um, so it might take some chicken wire to keep them out. But, um, you know, for the interim time, you go ahead and use mulch. Um, but just keep in mind that leaves are waiting in the wings for the future. Okay, the next question is, I have many big cypress trees in my backyard. Can I use their fallen leaves as good mulch for my rose garden? Why not? Use what you have, you know. I try not to overthink these things too much. Um, you know, if there's, I mean, I, I get leaves blowing in from the neighbor's yards, I use those. You know, use what you have on hand. Um, that's very economical as well. The next question is, I find it difficult to get anything to grow under our redwood trees. Do you have any suggestions? So um, if you have a chance to go and visit some natural redwood forests um, and see what's growing under there, um, things do grow under redwoods. Um, sorrel grows under them, ferns grow under them, um, our wild ginger grows under them, trilliums grow under them. Um, you know, but they don't, like, for example, sorrel is not there all the time. It comes up, it's sort of herbaceous, and then it disappears, but it will come up again. So they have, there's a seasonality to it. Uh, different ferns will definitely grow under um, redwoods. So, you know, take your cues from nature. Um, you know, add some logs for some, maybe some uh, decomposition of things, add a few boulders so that the roots of whatever plants that you put into there can sort of hide out from the redwoods and establish underneath the, the boulder. Um, 
So things like that. So things that normally grow under redwoods, you can grow under redwood. You can grow under redwoods. Just you have to be patient though. Okay, the next question is, can you advise us on how to attract monarchs? I've been concerned about the dramatic decline in their population. We've planted milkweed in our garden and it grows well, but after two years, there are no monarchs. What are we missing? Um, so, yeah, I mean, here in Palo Alto, we have a nice population of monarchs that's, um, that we see that, that kind of stay here uh, over winter. Um, and so you might want to try a couple of different kinds of milkweed. So there's uh, uh, Asclepius uh, fascicularis, which is a narrow leaf, as well as the speciosa, which is a bigger leaf. Um, so it might be that your, your milkweed is maybe not as attractive. Another thing too is that the butterflies are better at finding milkweed if it is at the edge of a habitat rather than in the interior because it's just easier for them to see it. Um, and then to plant something really bright next to it that will attract them for, for, the, for the nectar. Um, and those are tricks that I use uh, and I see monarchs in our gardens. Okay, the next question is, we have chickens in our backyard and they have destroyed the grass. Any ideas for plants or grass that chickens won't eat? Um, you might want to try some of the uh, native tuft, tufty grasses that we have, um, like uh, Mullenbergia rigans, for example, the deer grass. These uh, native tuft grasses um, have root systems that go uh, several feet into the ground. And actually, native grass is just another water thing with these long root systems actually help water get back into the ground table that way by channeling the water down um, through with their roots. Um, so I would try some tuft grasses like that. Um, but chickens, they're, uh, they're determined as well. So you have to try to stay one step ahead. Okay, any thoughts on preventing insects like carpenter bees? Uh, no. <laughs> so um, one of the things that happens, I mean, I love carpenter bees, the largest bees that we have in North America, and they're great pollinators. And so the things that keep insects in check, so like on this last slide, we have a katydid, and that katydid is somebody's lunch, okay? <laughs> and so um, what you want to do is invite predators into your landscape. And the way that you do that is to provide a variety of native species, at least 20 different species. If you provide up to 60 native species in your yard, you'll invite a variety and huge diversity of insects and you will get predators. And so there will be a sort of a natural um, reckoning of numbers amongst the predators and the prey um, because insects for the most part uh, feed their young uh, other insects. Bees are the exception. They feed their babies pollen. They're the tame vegetarians. Um, but try to encourage the, uh, uh, the predators. What I mean by predators are wasps. And so uh, wasps are great for controlling other insects. And even though they might ruin your picnic um, because they show up and want your hamburgers and your, your meat. One of the things that you can do to get them away from like picnics and things like that is to put a meat lure some distance away. Um, but really the best way to control insects is to provide a very big, wide, diverse plant palette of food for them. And you'll get all kinds of things coming in and they'll, they will sort it out. Okay, the next question is, can you recommend any books on pruning, pruning peren perennials, or do you think that's not something to worry about? The latter. I like to think of native gardens as being very low maintenance and really holding off on pruning. Um, some things, you know, if you want to prune for shape, um, that's uh, one thing. And there, there are lots of good guides out there for that. Um, 
other than for the habitat value, stems also provide support for new growth. And so rather than plants flopping over, if I leave the stems from last year, it supports the new growth. So, um, and with all these gardens, I try to figure out ways of reducing the time I have to maintain them. And if I don't have to prune them, uh, prune the plants, that just cuts back on the things that I have to do. I focus mostly on just keeping the weeds out. Okay, uh, the next question is, I love succulents. Are there any California succulents you can recommend? Oh, the Dudleya species. There are so many beautiful Dudleyas that we have here. One of my favorites, it's a beautiful plant, it's called Dudleya bretonii. And it's, it's a, a light sort of grayish white succulent that um, just lights up an area and they're super easy to grow. Um, and they don't, some of the, our succulents will shrivel up during the summertime after the spring rings are over. And you think, and this is a thing that California does, but they're not. That's just how they adapted to our climate is that they go dormant. And then with spring rains, all of a sudden the succulent pops back out, right? But the Dudley Bretonii does not do that. It actually maintains its form and it's uh, the moisture inside the leaves. Other ones don't. There, there are lots of different kinds. Um, take a look on Calscape and you'll be amazed at just the abundant Dudleyas and other succulents that we have. All right, the next question is, can you talk a little about costs for budgeting purposes for an average size lot? Typical costs for design, construction, hardscape, materials, and irrigation system. You know, that's a, a great question. It varies. Um, if you are starting from scratch and you're doing hardscape, um, it really depends on the access to the site because most of the costs really are labor costs. Materials tend to be cheap unless you go with something imported like Italy or something. Um, and it depends on what you use. Do you, are you doing a concrete pour for a patio? Are you doing flagstone on concrete? Are you doing flagstone on sand? Um, there are really a lot of um, variables. Um, you know, if you, I mean, and, and bids from contractors can vary hugely by thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, my typical um, design fees are a few thousand dollars. Um, for a full set of plans, it's several thousand dollars as I'm a licensed landscape architect. Um, construction costs, depending on what you do, can range from anywhere on the very low end of $100,000 and up. But it really depends on what you're doing. Um, if you're just doing, say, putting in a driveway, you know, it's going to be less. Um, you know, so not a not a really good answer to that question. It really just depends on what it is that you're hoping to achieve. Okay, we have a few more. Um, I think we have enough time to get through all of them. So the next one is what is the best way to get rid of Bermuda grass? Hi, um, you just, you have to keep after it. Uh, I like to take little patches at a time um, for weeds like that. And, um, you know, my approach to removing plants that I don't want is I do a little bit at a time, but I do a little bit all the time so that it adds up over time. Um, and you just have to keep at it day after day after day, little bits at a time, and that adds up to a lot over the course of a year. And that's kind of been the way that I maintain all the gardens is like, occasionally I'll do a, a weeding blitz where I spend several hours out there doing things. Um, I don't have time always for that. And I mean, really who does? So it's like, you know, 15 minutes a day on one thing and then maybe 15 minutes the next day on the same thing or
You were just frozen Next for uh, oh, okay. the Sorry. end of your question. <laughs> okay. We're all here now. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so the next question is huge areas of my yard are taken over by oxalis. What should be done as a better landscape design? Um, what should be done as a better landscape design is now done and carried out. So they have the landscape is already installed and they have oxalis in an existing landscape or they want the exhaust to come out first. So, um, oh, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> so, um, so really, you know, oxalis, um, there are a few different kinds that we have here in Palo Alto that's super annoying. It's like the big yellow one that's blooming now and everybody thinks it's really pretty. That stuff gets everywhere. That's actually pretty easy to pull out. The small oxalis that's like really tiny, um, that's in the seed bank, and that's going to take that's going to take you know the fifteen minutes a day for the next few years to get rid of. Um, and I have it in my yard, and so what I try to do is I chip away at it. And uh, sometimes because it is so small, I'll take little sections and just really go to town on those sections with. I'm not kidding you, bonsai tweezers and pull it out by the roots. And then I'll replace uh, in those bare areas with some other kind of native plant because the natives will change the soil chemistry and make it less hospitable to non-native plants. And um, so it's a multi-pronged strategy to try to get rid of oxalis, you know, the constant removal and then the replacement. But it's you know, people think of a landscape as once and done, but it's a living entity. So it's always a constant thing that's changing and, you know, and being engaged with it. It's a commitment, essentially. So we have one more in the Q&A box, and then I see a couple people with their hands up. So um, the last one from the Q&A um, chat is, is there any plant that can avoid ants? Um, maybe a plant that doesn't have any uh, nectar on it or any aphids on it. Um, and ants, uh, you know, they're, I, they're not my favorite insect. I know that they have a function in the environment, which is cleanup. Um, and, but they are attracted to sugar. Um, so they will be attracted to things that have uh, nectar, which is most blooming plants. Um, and anything where there are aphids, aphids are great um, for ants because they can get them to, create, to secrete a honeydew, which is a sugary substance. Um, you know, one thing that you can help, hope, for, hope for is to have a lot of birds in your backyard and they will help take care of the ants for you because they will eat them. So we actually just got one more in the chat and then we'll move on to those who have their hands raised. Um, the last one is what amendments will make native alkaline clay soil more friendly to native plants? Um, so I like to use a little bit of compost, uh, but I generally do not amend the soil. Um, Occasionally, if um, I'm digging a hole, and I try to only dig holes during the winter time when the ground is not hard as concrete, um, when it's easier during the rainy season to dig holes, I will sometimes mix in cactus mix into the soil to enhance the drainage there. Um, and then encourage leaf litter to build up, and that will help um, with the uh, establishment of plants in most soils. Okay, so there's a couple people who have their hands raised. Um, I'll go ahead and unmute you one at a time. So the first um, attendee that I see with their hand up is Becky. Um, if you still have a question, I'll go ahead and unmute you right now um, and let you chat and then um, we'll move on to the next question. I 
seems like you're still on mute, but if you still have a question, um, you can go ahead and speak now. That was a mistake. Thank you. Oh, no worries. That's okay. <laughs> so the next person was, I'm sorry if I pronounce your name incorrectly, but I believe it's I, he. Um, I'll go ahead and um, unmute you now. You have your hand up if you have any questions. Okay, I think that maybe might have been a mistake too. Um, that's okay. Well, I guess, so one more question actually just came into the um, question box. So I guess we'll, since we have some time, we can go on to that one. Um, this question is, any thoughts on weed prevention, but also friendly to native insects using wood mulch versus rock versus volcanic rock? Uh, weed prevention? Uh, yes. The, the question here, weed prevention? Okay, so. Yeah, so. Um, yeah. Okay, go. Um, so yes, it depends on the weed. Um, one of the, really gnarly weeds that we have at the Island Drive Garden is uh, arum, which is, uh, you know, irritating to the skin if you get the juice on it, on your skin. Um, and, you know, it's, it's extremely hard to get rid of because it, it will form a little bulb and then that bulb will form a whole bunch of little baby bulbs and you just can't pull it out of the ground easily because they like to get really deep in the soil. So one thing that we're trying over there the combination of things really is digging them up and then putting really heavy rocks on the top of them. <laughs> so if they can't come up because they can't push this really big stone out of their way, maybe that's a good way to get rid of them. Um, I try not to cover up the soil um, with something impervious like that because of the nesting that's that goes on in these areas. Um, you know, I'm always worried that I'm covering up some nest somewhere because you will end up with nests underground. Um, but uh, that's one way to get at the weeds. Um, and, but if you don't want something impervious like a rock or something like that, um, a really nice thing is a nice thick layer of mulch because um, the bees can probably get through that um, if it's not super thick. Um, and it does break down over time. So um, mulch is a useful thing. Um, you know, it gives you that nice uniform appearance and it covers up a lot of, um, of weeds that you may not want to look at. Um, so um, depending on the, the size of the intruder, um, then you can decide on what strategy do you think might work best. Okay, I think that was all for, or actually we just got one more question. Yes. Um, we, we still have some time, so we'll go ahead and um, do this one. Uh, this question is, what are the best plants for sidewalk strip planting? Um, th this person is allergic to junipers. Ah, um, for sidewalk planting. Well, funny you should ask that, as a matter of fact. Um, we are doing some sidewalk planting, uh, connecting our primrose and the Gwenda Street Gardens along the uh, sidewalk there. Um, and we are planting low growing Ceanothus because we have to maintain a, you know, a low growing thing so that people can see with cars. Um, so a nice low growing Ceanothus is good. We are also, and you can walk along the sidewalk there and see what we have planted. We have um, um, at the the corner of, we just did the corner of Newell and Embarcadero going down to Mark Twain across the street from Rinconada Park. We labeled the plants. We have a Salvia Dara's Choice, um, which is more of a ground cover, stays very low, has nice purple blossoms on it. There's a nice ground cover Arctostaphylus. This is uh, Arctostaphylus Edmundsii variety Carmel Sir, and that will spread to about eight feet wide and stay about six inches tall. So um, those are 
um, another section that we've been working on. We've planted um, our native iris, Iris de Glaciana, um, which is a wonderful plant, super low water use, and um, stays green all the time, gives your beautiful blossoms, and there are some hybrids actually that have lots of different colors. So irises are wonderful plants. They can kind of give that sort of um, vase-shaped uh, foliage, sort of grassy and strappy looking, uh, very nice. Um, you know, poppies, if you don't want to spend a lot of money, a nice packet of poppy seeds um, go a long way, especially the uh, maritime poppy, the yellow poppy, which forms a taproot um, and is more perennial than the orange uh, poppy. But there are lots of different poppy species. Um, and they don't get very tall either. It's super easy and super cheap to do. You could also do um, our native bulbs um, for a sidewalk planting, especially if it doesn't get much water because these bulbs literally do not want water in the summertime. They'll come up. And so we have like native hyacinth that comes up. Um, we have uh, native lilies that come up. Um, lots of different kinds of uh, beautiful things that can go uh, into the, the sidewalk strip. So lots of choices, certainly. Okay, well, that was all for the Q&A. Um, I guess now we can just go ahead and wrap things up. Um, again, just to remind everyone, um, I know I put it in the chat, but there's a survey. If you could please fill it out before leaving um, the webinar today, we'll also send it out um, in the follow-up email. If you don't have a chance to fill it out today, you can fill it out then. Um, and also just a reminder that the recording will be available on our website, cityofpaloalto.org, um, probably within about a week or so. Um, and then uh, we'll also be including that in the follow-up email as well. And then uh, again, please take the time to fill out the survey. We really like your feedback and definitely for future events, we take your feedback from these surveys on date and time and also what topics you guys are interested in. So please take some time and do the survey if you haven't done so. Um, also with those materials we'll send out, Will be those um, landscape rebates that we partner with Valley Water. So if you have some um, grass that we'd like to remove and go with more native plants that you've learned today, there's actually rebates and we actually match the district's rebate. So it's actually increased for Palo Alto residents. So instead of just a dollar, it's two dollars per square foot with a max of three thousand dollars if you're interested in even downsizing that turf with more um, usable area. If you have, say, those animals and kids that still need some rec area, you can still downsize and replace um, some of that with natives. You don't have to do a full conversion. There's also hardware rebates. So if you're looking to keep that grass and water it more uh, efficiently, there's hardware upgrades and also weather-based irrigation controllers. Um, so we'll send that material out. There's also a free outdoor survey. So if you're wanting to see um, your yard and getting recommendations tailored to your um, property, um, someone from the Valley Water will actually come out to your residence and actually give a full assessment. That assessment can also be used for pre-approval for these rebates. So if you're kind of wanting to see just keeping your current stuff and how you can upgrade it, or if you're wanting to actually see what you'd be eligible for in incentives, that's a great start. Because again, like 50% of your water use could be going just directly outside. So if you're wanting to see how to cut your water bill, definitely reach out and we'll send those resources out to you if you're interested in setting up a waterways outdoor survey. And there's also ways to send um, a do-it-yourself kit. So if you're wanting to see how you can conserve water inside, we'll send that information to you guys as well. But it seems we haven't received any additional questions at this time. And we're coming up to the end. Um, again, the materials we'll be sending out, the recordings, and again, you should get it within the next week or next week. Um, but I think that's everything on our side. Do you have any last remarks on closing out? Okay. So thank you everyone for attending. Um, and again, we'll send out information. And then for future events, if you haven't done so, we have our newsletter. So we'll send that information up if you wanted to be notified for any other future events 
from Palo Alto, you can sign up for our newsletter to be informed of other future events like this coming up. Thank you again for joining us tonight.